the difficult part because it's the afternoon now, after lunch, and most of us are already half asleep. <laughs> All right? But rest assured, one thing, I have never fallen asleep under my own preaching. <laughs> I don't know. Pastor, maybe you, have you fallen asleep when you were preaching? <laughs> okay? It's very hard to fall asleep when you're preaching. <laughs> okay. But uh, I hope everyone had a good... Uh, Break and I, I know it's it's nice to be in here because it was, uh, it was starting to get quite hot outside. Okay, so let's do this. Uh, Pastor, how much time do we have? This is now two fifty-three. Uh, what time do we have to run out? In our schedule, we we finish at five o'clock. Okay. All right, because uh, I'm, I'm trying to see maybe if I can, then we'll try to do it as a kind of, uh, we'll have a break and then we'll resume okay. uh, something like that. Yeah, all right. So two hours, we have one break, Pastor. Yeah, yeah something like that. We'll, we'll, see, we'll try to see if we can do that, okay? Okay, because uh, I want to kind of cover more ground and then so uh, I'm going to try to see if we can be able to kind of move from one topic to another, okay? So... All right, so let's open our Bibles and um, we will, I just want to look at one verse and I'll read this, okay, just to save some time. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Okay, I'm, I'm just going to read this. Uh, okay, we can read this aloud together with me, all right? Begin. Let all things be done decently and in order. Right? First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 40. Let all things be done decently and in order. Let's pray. Father, thank you for even the break and the lunch that we could have. I pray and ask right now that you will help us to be attentive, even though uh, our flesh will fight with us because uh, we will be tired and sleepy in the afternoon. And Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit will help us to be accepted to the teaching and the preaching of your word. Um, empower me, strengthen me, use me as your instrument that I can do this with all godly wisdom and not with the wisdom and thought of men. Open our hearts also. I pray that uh, our hearts will be tender, take away all distractions. We commit time to you in Christ's name pray. Amen. Okay, so... I just want to start off with this opening thought, right? That the New Testament church is a place, is the place for the saints to come together where things are set in order. All right? Where things are put in their proper place, where things that may have been messy uh, or uh, uh, maybe unscriptural, not according to God's plan or design, whoever, but this is the place that where we assemble, we come together, where we learn how to put all these things back in the place where it will be pleasing to God, it will be according to His word, according to His design, and this is the place where we practice all that. Okay, where we practice all that. And here, when in, con in dealing with all these issues, Paul wrote to the Corinthians, right, and they were having a number of uh, different problems and issues in the church. Right? When you get to chapter 14, you're going to find that uh, he addresses, e even in terms of the abuse of spiritual gifts, uh, uh, and, and the in and during the worship session, and, uh, uh, the, the worship service and all that, right? he, gives, he lays out a whole bunch of rules and in terms of uh, order of conduct and how the church should function when they assemble together. Now, so when he ends this chapter, he said this, right? he lays this out as a principle, he says, let all things, everything, Right? Everything is to be done what? Decently. Okay? And in order. Decently. All right? If you look up the Strong's definition, right? Decently, honestly, in a seemly manner. Right? It's elsewhere it's translated in the in the New Testament as uh, honestly. Right? And then here, um, in order. So in other words, uh, there's a proper arrangement, there's a proper uh, succession or sequence, whoever. Now, in other words, try to picture this now. The 
New Testament church is to be a place where in all things that we do, we are to be led by the Spirit. But there is no chaos at the same time. Okay? There is no chaos at the same time. Now, in other words, think of it this way, that it has the flexibility where things can change or improvise or we can build on and we, it's always, it's not, does not necessarily have to have a rigid structure. But there is a sense of structure. Okay, it's one thing for uh, maybe a an or, uh, school band or orchestra to play such that they may adapt or change during the while they're playing, where they may speed up the tempo, they may slow it down, they can uh, based on the way the conductor is leading them, things can change. Versus everybody playing a totally different piece of music. Okay. So there is a loose coordination, but uh, as led by the Holy Spirit of God, okay? And, but things are, this is the place where progressively, bit by bit, and throughout the lifespan of the church and also the lifespan of the members, that the areas of disorder in our lives also are now put into their proper place. Understand this, that every one of us joining as members of a New Testament church, bring with us all sorts of issues and problems. Okay? Every single one of you. Every single one of us, we have personal faults, issues, areas that God needs to work on. All right? At the same time, as a church, we're going to see here that if we are a church that's setting things in order, you're going to see that there will be progressive, gradual improvement in small things daily, weekly, as the months go by such that if someone were to go away for a while and come back, you're going to see, wow, what happened here? Wow, I, know, I love this. All right, this is amazing. Okay? Realize this, that this is true in many areas and aspects of our lives. Okay? The picture that we try to portray on the wedding day is usually backwards. Okay? It's usually backwards because it pictures this dashing bridegroom and then this radiant bride who is so beautiful and all that and we sometimes forget that that is supposed to be the end product okay that's not the beginning the beginning is very different but if we are making progress if we are growing in the Lord and we're walking with the Lord together however this will build up and build up and what happens that's why Ephesians 5 talks about how that the uh, as far as the ministry of the husband to the wife, that he will be able, like Christ, one day be able to present to himself a beautiful, right, a chaste virgin bride, not having any spot or blemish or any, right, any such thing. Why? Because there is an improvement as you move forward. The problem with, most, with, uh, with a lot of weddings is that after the beautiful, wonderful wedding day, it all goes downhill. Okay? But understand this, that the way it starts... You and I are not there yet. Okay? But when we're joined as part of a New Testament church, that the principle of operation here is that we are working all towards setting things in order in our lives and in our church so that when you come back after a period of time, you're going to see there is growth, maturity, and improvement. All right? So, we see, I, when I looked at the New Testament, all right, I did the search on this, we see that order is important. Luke chapter 1, verse 3 to, uh, uh, verse one to uh, chapter 1, verse 1 to 3, when Luke wrote his, this gospel account, notice his intention. For as much as many have taken in hand to set forth in order a declaration of those things which are most surely believed among us. Even as they delivered them unto us, which from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee in order, most excellent Theophilus. And so Luke writes to Theos Theophilus, right, and tells him, look, he wants to set forth in order a declaration you know, to lay out a proper systematic account of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ 
his ministry on earth, right? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, all these things to lay it out in a what proper and systematic way. Okay? Now, God who created all things, heaven and earth and all that, sets everything in order. You will notice in that in all of creation, in this entire universe, you will see that there are underlying inherent rules that govern everything. We have the laws of physics. You'll see inherent in mathematics there are all sorts of laws. Okay? Man only in doing our research and study, we uncover what already is there. We recognize that in our study, in our uh, discovery. Okay, men did not come up with those laws. Okay, but those laws are there, revealing to us that in this universe there is a structure, there is an order to it. Yes, in recent decades we, we've come to discover a new type of science called chaos. And chaos theory, why? Because ever since the fall of Adam onwards, the, the whole universe is growing in increasing chaos. But that is contrary to his very nature. The nature of God is what? He is a God of design. That's why he lays out over and over again patterns for how we live. Right? The pattern and design for marriage. Right? The pattern and design for a family. Right? For how a church should function, how it should govern. Uh, even though there is room for free will and room for liberty, there is a pattern and a structure. Okay, all this reflects his nature as God and creator. I believe it is reflected, it ought to be reflected also in the music. All right, how we, how we use or play our music, it will reflect that. Now, as I said, it, it is not to if you examine the issue of music, you're going to see it's not to the extent where it's so rigid that it becomes lifeless. Right? Music that's very rigid, you'll notice if it's just exactly according to the metronome and whatever, it, it, it sounds robotic. Why? Because the human element is there. Okay? And human beings, when they play, even if they keep the proper timing, you will notice there's always some minor variation. Okay? Now, Paul, as I mentioned uh, the other day when in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, right, he writes and addresses a church that is full of problems, okay, that things were not set in order. There were all sorts of disorder. And so he, the purpose of the epistle was to deal with all these issues. And I want us to see here that as we move on on this, I, I will be dealing with the kinds of people and what God will use to set things in order in the church. In other words, okay, now I just want to kind of step back a bit. Let's look at the whole big picture here. The point I'm trying to make is this. Every New Testament church is in the business of biblical problem solving. Amen. Okay? We're in the business of biblical problem solving. We're in the business of fixing broken things and broken people. Okay, so once we understand that, then that settles this for us uh, concerning church membership and all that. That, you know, it is very foolish to say, well, uh, pastor, I need to like, kind of, let me, give me six months, let me kind of fix up my life, whatever, and then when I'm good enough to be a member, I will going to join. No, 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 no. That's not how it works. All right, because the, the New Testament church in others is a place where the messed up people who have been saved by the grace of God and by the blood of Jesus Christ now come together to get their, all the issues fixed. How? By the ministry of the word. Amen. All right? So let's be fair. Let's be very clear. I'm, I'm going to be very fair. You are messed up. You are messed up. You are messed up. I'm messed up. He's messed up. Okay? We're all in different states of disorder. But God's going to use the New Testament church and the ministry of the word to set things in order. Alright? So that's why there is no such thing as, well, a church member or a family that has to be kind of shaped up good enough in order to qualify to join as a member of church. The well, what matters is, are they saved? Do they know the Lord Jesus Christ? Are they prepared to follow Him as disciples? Alright? Because everything else can be sorted out. Where? Here. <laughs> 
Okay, so. Okay, we got that. Now, notice, turn to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians. Right? Now, again in verse 34, you're going to see this, that um, this is the chapter where Paul actually deals with a few issues and then sets certain things in place concerning the proper conduct of the Lord's Supper. All right? He lays out certain things. He tells them at the beginning of the chapter that this is an ordinance to keep the ordinance, to remember Paul, verse 2, in all things, to keep the ordinances that were delivered to them. All right? He talks about then that the, the issue that uh, when they were to come about in the Lord's Supper, in doing all this, that... Uh, there should be a unity. There should be no division or contention or division. And there will be, and along the way, he deals with this, I think, up to verse 16, the, uh, some contention concerning the covering of the woman's head and all that. All right. He tells them that they will come together in, in, um, come together in verse 17. All right, they come together and then uh, notice that verse 18, it tells them that there ought to be no divisions. All right, verse 19, that, there'll be, uh, that you know, the, there was some issue of heresies among them. And there was, the verse 20 is to come together into one place. It's local. All right, in a visible local assembly that they're going to partake of this. Now, if you look at verse 34, Having dealt with all this and the proper conduct and whatever, he tells them after that, he says, if, and, and if any man hunger, let him eat at home, that ye come not together unto condemnation. And the rest will I set in order when I come. Okay? Because why? He, he describes to them what the Lord's Supper is, right? The breaking of the bread, drinking, uh, okay? Sh drinking, sharing from, of that cup. He warned that there were consequences, those who eat and drink unworthily, right? Such that there were, some of them, what happens? This is for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you and many sleep. So what happens? When the Lord's Supper was conducted in a very disorderly manner, they did not wait for one another. It's kind of like McDonald's, whoever, first come, first serve. Okay? They didn't wait for one another. Uh, it was messy, it was disorderly, and then some of them, you know, they didn't, they didn't set them, get themselves right with God before partaking of this, or uh, whether it was unconfessed sin or whatever. They ate, and then what happens? For this cause, many are weak. Physical weakness, all right? Chronic illness, sickly, and then premature death. Now, as sad and tragic as all this is, when this happens, you know one thing? It confirms I'm a child of God. All right? It is an evidence of the salvation, but God dealt with His children. And there were all these problems in the church. That's why it says, for if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord that we should not be condemned with the world. All right? Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together, tarry one for another. Notice, wait for one another. Why? Because this is a corporate ordinance to be partaken together, not separately, Okay, in Singapore, we, in, 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 our, in Singlish, we, we say own time, own target. Okay, you don't do that. Why? Because it's corporate. We do it together. Then, but notice in verse 34, he, he dealt with all this in chapter 11. Why? Because he addresses the most urgent matters. All right, if any man hunger, let him eat at home that you come not together unto condemnation. Then he says, and the rest will I set in order when I come. Why? Because there were other things that needed to be set in order. But what Paul did was this, that part, that's not this. In this verse, it tells me one thing. There are some things that are very urgent, highly important, that sometimes we must deal with immediately and fix. But some things, Pastor, we may have to wait. And Paul said, this one, some of the other matters, it can wait till I arrive there and we'll talk about it. Okay? Because when we content for the faith, right? And we set ourselves to the task of setting things in order in the New Testament church. Okay, why do we have to contend for the faith? Because the, what we're seeing is our various issues and things where churches are in a state of disorder that need to be set right. But 
Church, I also want to tell everyone here, based on this verse, understand this, that not every battle needs to be dealt with immediately. Right? The most crucial, the most urgent things should be dealt with immediately. Right? And then things, I'm not saying they are not important, but I'm saying sometimes they are less urgent. It buys us some time. Okay, it buys us some time. If you do the study in Nehemiah, you're going to see that the urgent thing was to get the walls up to a certain point and then that buys them some time so that now the pressure is off everyone and then they can address other issues. Okay, because if we don't do that, what happens in many cases is that we start to feel very overwhelmed. You can get very discouraged. Because why? We're not picking our battles and we're trying to tackle everything at the same time. Not everything is equal urgency. Okay? If, for instance, one of, our, the, one of the babies has a very bad accident, right? Blood is splurting, spurting everywhere. Now, what's the first thing we want to do? We want to stop bleeding. All right? Does it matter whether at that point we should change the diaper? I don't think so. We can deal with that one later, but if you don't deal with this one, you're going to have a dead baby very soon. All right, so understand this. There, there is the issue of the level of urgency. But is it important? Things that are urgent are not always the same thing as important. Things that are urgent demand immediate action. Things that are, okay, things that are not so urgent but are still important, do require our priority. But they don't always demand immediate action. So that helps us to understand there is a difference between things that are highly urgent and highly important. That's the thing that you have to deal with the most. Right? Things that are important but not urgent, you have a bit more time. Right? There are some things that are urgent but not important, you still have to prioritize that because Otherwise, uh, you could have a problem. And there are some things that are not important and not urgent. Don't worry about it. Okay? So, what I want us to see here is that Paul, in writing to the Corinthians, he addresses these things, fixes the most urgent one. Because why? If you have a whole bunch of members who are weak and sickly and then even dead, that's not a good thing. He needed to set that right. Okay? The rest of it... When he arrives, he can deal with it. Now, Colossians chapter 2, verse 5. Notice he praises, Paul writes and praises the church. Right? He says, For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit. Right? Paul says he cannot be there, but he's present with them in the spirit. He says, Joying and, notice, beholding your order. Okay? And. It says, and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. Paul, who could not always be there in that church, but he's saying, look, I, I'm watching you from afar. I'm hearing the news and the reports, whatever, of what's going on in the church. And he says, you know, he's joying with them. He's behold, why? By beholding their order. Okay? So, in other words, if we're growing as a church, and developing and maturing, we will be increasing in our order. And this brings joy to the pre to the pastor, the missionary, right? To see that this is happening. Okay? In other words, so I'm gonna put out this hypothesis here for everyone to consider. If we get this picture together, what we see is this church membership. Is not passive. You get what I'm saying here? Church membership is not passive, but participative. Why? Because everyone has a part to play in bringing order in the church. Okay? Even after doing that, everyone has a part to play in maintaining that order in the church. Okay? Now, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay? Now, you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Now, I want you to just quickly scan down this chapter 
And let's do a very simple interactive exercise here. Let's identify what some of the words that Paul uses right, to describe the members and their relationship also with the pastor and with, with their relationship with God. You know, what are some of the words? Because all these words suggest to us some level, some form of participation and involvement. Right? Let's, let's just scan down. Let's say, okay, just look at the first nine verses. Can anyone tell me what, what do we see here? Anyone? Hmm? Okay. What are the words that describe our involvement or our participation? Hmm? What's that? Laborers. You see that? Where? Which verse was that? Verse 9, right? We are laborers. The next word is very important. Together. You see that? Co-laborers. We work together. Okay? I, I, actually, I want to mention a point here which I, uh, I emphasized to Pastor just now. When you look at this, laborers together, focus on the word together. Okay, it suggests a unity. It suggests a unity of purpose. Right? Because why? What's important is not just that, well, look, there's a bunch of us here who uh, attend this conference. We are all of like mind. We're in agreement. The, the, the goal that we want to aim towards is to get as many people on board as possible in agreement so that we can labor together to pull together. Now, just look at verse 9. Is there any other word that describes us? Hmm? Right? It says, ye are God's what? Husbandry. Right? Um, implying this, is, uh, this has to do with what? It's, it's like, okay, we're like a farm or a plantation. Right? And God is doing the work. And, we, and, and by the way, if you have a farm or plantation, we're dealing with living things. Okay, ye are God's building. Now, can I think it should be obvious to everyone that every building has some form of structure, All right? Because if there's no structure, what happens? It's like a building that's designed or built by a madman. Okay, there is such a building I, I, I heard about that I didn't get the chance to visit. All right, I think it's called I think it's called the Winchester House. Okay, because I think it was the daughter or the granddaughter of Winchester, you know the Winchester rifle. She inherited all that well, but then she went a little crazy. As she went crazy, she started to build all sorts of extensions to the house. Today is a museum that you actually can visit because right, there are staircases that lead to nowhere. Okay, there are doors that open and then you're, you're, out, you're outside of the, the building. Okay, all sorts of crazy things, right? Because she went a little cuckoo. All right, now, God's building will reflect his person and nature. He is a God of design and order. Now, there are other words in here. Can you, can you, can you find them? Okay, verse 10, what do we see? It says here that there is a wise master builder. Okay, when you look up that word, all right, I think, to, okay, I'm not an expert on Greek, but I think it was an architecton from which you get the word architect. Okay, Paul describes himself, his role as the architect. He's a wise master builder. All right, uh, there is a, he, the master builder has to decide which, what comes first, what comes next, what is the priority, all right? And all these things, in order for all these things to be put together, but who are the laborers? It's every one of us, all right? In other words, where I'm building this up to is this, God is you and I, everyone, taking up our role to be involved in the work of building, to establish an increasing order in the church. Because why? One person or the pastor cannot do it all. It's simply not possible. 
He tells them, in fact, um, in, when he rebuked them in the earlier part, all right, uh, okay, it says, verse 4, for while one said, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are ye not carnal? Who then is Paul and who is Apollos? But ministers by whom ye believe, even as the Lord gave to every man. God gives to every man what? Ministers. Who are they? Servants. Right? They were saying, oh, I'm of Paul. I follow Apollos. But he says, hey, we're only servants. Why are you so man centered Why is there one fan club fighting the other fan club and all that? He says, we're merely servants. All right? He says, I have planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. All right? And yet, yet, over and over again, what happens is this. Do you see here that this, there is a partnership? One will do the planting, another one did the watering, someone else came along and did the reaping, but never forget one thing. It is God who works behind the scenes to give the increase. And yet, in the... the now, he rebukes them. All, right, all this fighting among themselves, what did he tell them in verse 3? For ye are yet carnal. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Now, why is that the case? Because they were divided against each other. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, you know. Uh, I, I want more souls for the Lord than this other guy, whoever. But he says, hey, don't you remember? It is God that gave the increase. Who are you? And yet, we give out all sorts of awards to recognize only the reapers. What about the one that planted and what about the one that watered? Hmm? Someone has to lay down the foundation. The, the last guy just happened to come along and he reaped. All right, so, now he, so the point is, he points out, okay, there are some, okay, there are laborers, there are ministers, all right, in other words, servants, what, what else do we see? Okay, in working with God, he says, that, so then, okay, verse 7, so then neither is he that planted anything, neither is he that watered. Do you get the point here? He says, whoever plants, whoever waters, they're nothing. But God is the one. He says, but God that giveth the increase. All right, look at verse 8. Now he that planted and he that watereth are one. They're part of the same effort, same team. But we give awards only to the one that scores the three points short. You know, after a while, everybody wants to be the one that scores. And the team that, where everybody wants to be the scorer and nobody passes the ball or defense will lose. Hmm? Yeah, it says, Now he that watereth, he that planted, and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. Why? Because God is the righteous judge. When he gives out his rewards, you know, he will recognize everyone proportionately, accurately, correctly for their effort. So he tells them, that's why he says, in dealing with all this fighting, right, he says, look, we're all merely ministers, only servants. God is the one that brings the increase. So you know what? Why is there this trying to strive for a higher status than somebody else or we're fighting over who is more important? Right? It says we are laborers together with God. Verse 9. Right? We are His husbandry, God's building. It's part of this whole thing that God is putting together. Right? God is the one that's putting everything together in the church. According to the grace of God which is given unto me. So God gives grace to certain people, additional grace to certain people. Why? To fulfill their job or task as the wise master builder the problem one of the problems we're having today is that some churches do not have a wise master builder they have a master builder sometimes they have a mastermind <laughs> right uh, but it needs godly wisdom to do it right okay sometimes and can I say this to, to the members sometimes because of the grace of God that is given, especially to the master builder. You may not always understand why 
something may be of a higher priority to the pastor than what you think. All right? That's why we're taught to know them that have the rule over you. All right? Know them. Why? Because sometimes you have to know their heart. Over time, you come to understand why this may be a greater priority or reason. And don't forget, sometimes because of the greater ministry experience, we recognize that this is not the main thing. It's something else. Right? Sometimes when I'm talking to someone and they're telling me about the problem, whatever, as the more information I get, the more I start to see the picture, I realize, no, this is not the real problem. This is this other issue is the real problem. Okay? So it says here, I have laid the foundation and another builder thereon. It's very sad, right? You see here today, someone will we build upon each other's work. Here you have a picture that the New Testament church will grow in increasing order and glory. How? when we sit and stand on the shoulders of giants. But, you know, this rarely happens today because of pride, egotistical leaders who need to claim all the glory. No one's allowed to build upon. Okay? I don't see a need to have to reteach and re-preach everything. There's stuff that's there. I use it. I build on that. Why? Because we don't have a lot of time. I don't have a lot of years left to live. Okay? Even if you say you give me 20 more years, that's not a lot of time. All right? And we build upon that. It says, but, it says, but let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon. Thereupon. All right? For, no, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. All right? If... If we say, this is the church that Dr. So and So built, this verse tells us we got a problem. Because why? We need to build upon the Lord Jesus Christ, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Okay, we're, so Paul says, I'm an architect, right? I'm a wise master builder, right? He says, I'm also merely a servant. Right? We labor, we co-labor together. And God needs to use people, men and women, in the New Testament church to be able to do all these things. You notice it's not just a few selected, uh, uh, all those who surrendered to the ministry. It says here, you know, there were many co-laborers. Right? Verse 9, we are laborers together. And so, if we see this, I want us to realize, all right, let's turn to uh, Titus chapter 1, that God uses all sorts of people and, and in particular also uh, certain men in a position of leadership to set things in order in the New Testament church. Okay? Look at Titus chapter 1. Look at verse 5. It says, For this cause left I thee in Crete. Right? Paul writes to Titus and he tells them, Look, here's the reason why I left you on the island of Crete. Right, which is in the Mediterranean Sea, that thou shouldest what set in order the things that are one thing, and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Now, so what did he say here? He says, "Look, the reason I, Titus, I left you there in in Crete is because I gave you a special mission and assignment, which is to set in order the things that are one thing." Now, what does that mean? To set things in order, right? The things that are wanting, he's telling them, right? He's telling Titus, look, I want you to set in order all the deficiencies, all the areas that need work, all the areas where the church falls short of where it needs to be. You get what I'm saying here? If you understand this verse, you will realize something. It is ridiculous to go around looking for a perfect church. Because the whole business of the New Testament church is to set things in order. Every church, if they're healthy, they are a church of Jesus Christ, is a work in progress. 
It is a construction site. Remember, there was an architect and a master builder? And he's a master builder, there are other builders. There are other construction workers also. All right. In other words, when we make a decision, say, I want to transfer my membership and to join here, or I want to be baptized and to join as a member of, of the, this church here, I have to be prepared that I'm going to roll up my sleeves and get to work. Amen. All right. Maybe I have to start somewhere small, but, and I grow and, and I get more training, whatever, I can move on to other things, but I have to get involved. Why? Because this is what it's about. Okay? Yes, what's happened in a lot of churches is this. All right, people come in and say, okay, this is a construction site. So I'm going to stand around and I'm going to be the foreman. I'm going to tell everybody what to do. I'm going to supervise everybody. No, we need to get to work. And here he, he tells them, all right, he says, to set in order the things that are wanting. Every church has areas where there are things wanting. Okay? And you don't have to be a genius or to know rocket science in order to point out all the faults. I can tell you this. Any fool can point out there are problems in this church or in my church. You don't need to be a genius to do that. But you know something? You need to be a committed member in order to be part of those who will set things in order. Amen. Right. And the cry of every pastor's heart is, Lord, give us more laborers, give us more people who are willing to come on board, step up, be part of the solution Instead of just identifying problems, because right, we can already identify those problems. We don't need your help for that sometimes. Seriously, sometimes I tell folks, I say, look, yes, thank you for pointing this out, but the reality is this. I, I can, for every problem that you point out, there are another 20 others that I can identify. Okay, but when are we going to step up to do something about it? All right, and so, now, Understand this, it begins with the leadership. That's why he says, and ordain elders in every city. All right, why? Because there were churches in every city, as I had appointed thee. All right? So the understand this that the pastor who comes, right, the, the elders that are appointed and ordained have a role and a duty where they are going to be what? Problem solvers. Okay? Which is why it's important for everyone to know, the, be proficient and to know the word of God. Why? Because you use this to solve problems. Okay? We use this to solve the problems. And there were a number of problems that uh, Paul identified with respect to this church. Now, because that they are going to be problem solvers, all right, to set things in order, you will notice from verse 6 onwards, he lays out the scriptural qualifications, all right, which describe the spiritual qualities and also the character and the way of life of these men that are going to be needed to take the lead in solving problems. Okay? Before I kind of get into that, I, one of the things I've actually, over the last number of years, I've, I've been more and more convinced is, I wish, okay, I wish actually that uh, if I were to, if I were in a position to conduct Bible school training, that I would put some of the students, I would put the students through one, at least one semester to learn some engineering basics, Why? Right? Because it will teach you how to formulate the problem and then analyze this problem so that you can solve the problem. Because what many times people are, pastor, what people are taught in Bible school is this, oh, this problem, well, you just take this and this, use this magic formula, boom, right? Then you take this and this, boom, and if it doesn't work, well, you can always resign the church. Okay, and there is a false picture that, oh, every church, you know, it's, it's supposed to be uh, the moment you surrender and you uh, give your life to serve God, whoever, that uh, you have a comfortable, peaceful, blissful life with no problems. No, that's not how it works. Because you're going to see here, Paul tells Tim Titus to appoint men and then throw them right into the problems. And yet, my experience has been, I see so often men beg on their knees with their wives, pastors, praying to God to take them out of the problems when, you know what, that was their job. That was their job. Okay, now it says, if any man be 
blameless. Right? Of impeccable character. It says, um, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly. Why? Right? Because um, we're told in First Timothy chapter 3, if any man, you know, you cannot rule your own house, how, how are you going to rule the house of God? If there's disorder in the home, how can you bring order in the church? You see the intimate relationship between the marriage and the pastoral ministry? Right? Children. They, the little children, is it? They are not the, the faithful children. Right? It says they're not accused of riot or unruly. Now it says, for a bishop must be blameless as the steward of God. A steward takes care of things on behalf of the owner. In other words, it's not his church. You ought not to act like it's his church. He ought to behave like he is a faithful caretaker who will be accountable to the one who owns this church. Whom, and who, we know that who he is, right? Because it's God that purchased her with his own blood. Okay? It says, steward of God, it says, not self-will. Why? Because it's not going to be your way, my way, or as pastors like to say, my way or the highway, but it ought to be God's way. It's got to be by the will of God for our lives. That's why you see how important it is as a personal, individual discipline to constantly be seeking, knowing, and obeying Obeying the will of God. Okay? It says here, not self will not soon angry. Person who cannot restrain himself and his flesh has no business, right, being in the ministry. One area of the restraint will show in the dealing with anger. Do we get angry? Of course we'll get angry, but you know what? Can we restrain that? Not soon angry. So not given to why? No striker. Not given to filthy looker. All right? Now, there's a whole bunch of things, so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to skip past that. Now, go down to verse 9. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. Holding fast the faithful word as he had been taught. Now, what was the purpose? That he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayer. Now, why is all this important? Now, because one of the major cause of disorder has to do with people in the church. And in the case of the, church in, the churches in Crete, there were those that were steering every, everyone away from the truth into error. So this man... As a pastor, the, the requirement was this. He is not, the main requirement is not that he is a friendly, nice guy that everybody loves. Right? But that one of the things was that he is able to hold fast the faithful word so that what, using sound doctrine, he can exhort and also to convince or convict those who are arguing those who are contentious, those who are debating. You have to know this, right? None of us know this perfectly. I'm still learning, right? That's why I like questions because I, it's a matter of time. I'm going to hit onto a question where my short answer is, I don't know. I'll get back to you. Let me figure this one out, all right? But here, it talks about someone who is proficient in all this. This is another church, we need to insist, right, that the men and pastors, the elders of the church are men who really know the Bible. Okay? And when they know the Bible, it's not about their speaking ability or their ab ability to deliver a sermon, but it's about do they know this? Is there a working knowledge? Because... The only way you are going to deal, set things in order is by applying this. Okay, the proof, in other words, of whether you and I know the word of God is not in 
how much of this stuff, how many semesters of the Bible Institute or all this that we've gone into our heads is now what comes out? Can we use this to help someone to solve the problem? Can we use this to show someone, here's how we deal with this, right? For the pastor, you notice in his marriage and his home, it will be seen how does he go about dealing with those problems in his own marriage and in his own family. Why? Because he will have problems. Right? One of the, uh, as we dealt with this in the Q&A session just now, one very main area was finances. Why? Because if he doesn't use a scriptural method using sound doctrine to solve those problems, members will follow the wrong way. They'll copy what he does. Right? If he uses human wisdom and human reasoning to deal with that, they will do the same. Now, in other words, there is an aspect of the teaching ministry concerning the Word of God that is played out using the life example. How we go about doing things as a marriage or as a family, right? Modeled for us, not just the pastor, by the way, the deacons also. Now, it says here, for there are many unruly and vain talkers and deceivers, especially they of the circumcision. Well, it's okay. Let them talk. Let them say whatever, whatever the one that's liberty, right? No. It says, whose mouths must be stopped. Amen. There's no room for that. Okay? Those who, notice, they were unruly. Notice, not willing to come under rule, not willing to submit, all right? They do their own things. It says, vain talkers and deceivers, all right? Uh, here it says, though they of the circumcision, so we're referring to what? The Jews who were trying to bring the yoke of the law back to those who had already been saved. Yeah. Or it says, whose mouths must be stopped. It says, the, now here is where the, now in Setting things in order, the pastor or the elder must be confrontational when necessary. Amen. Just stop their mouths, shut them up, silence them. Why? Because this is not allowed to just to perpetuate, to continue. Okay? Elsewhere, Paul wrote to Timothy and he told him what? To allow no other doctrine, only this. Oh, the pastor is so narrow minded. It should be as narrow as this Bible. Amen. Allow no other doctrine. So it says here, whose mouth must be stopped. Why? Because it says, who subvert whole houses. Do you realize entire church assemblies was steered away from the truth because of these people? It says, teaching things which they ought not. You see that? Things that they should not teach, they were teaching. It says, for what reason? Money. Money. For filthy lucrative sake. Ah, now we see things, there are things that are taught and they're pushed and they subvert. Okay, you, are, you have to understand it's very seductive. Okay, it subvert entire uh, church assemblies. Why? For the sake of money. Not only, that's not the only reason. You'll see in the next few verses that one of the areas of disorder comes from our culture. The culture, the people that we come from, right, they have their inherent problems. Every race, right, every culture has its unique set of problems. Do you realize that? Sometimes you, you'll know, you, you can tell from the popular music that drunk people like to sing. Okay, in every country, they sing about different things. Okay, uh, I think you go to Taiwan, people sing about unfaithful women and you know getting drunk. You know, others sing about you know all sorts of issues. Okay, in some cultures, uh, again, it's uh, unique in that drunkenness and wife beating is common. It's almost seen as the norm. And in, in, in you know, in Chinese culture, for instance, a lot of times it's uh, gambling, womanizing, and drunkenness. In some other cultures, it is drugs. 
Okay? So here he says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own. Now, we're not talking about a prophet of God. Okay? Uh, the, the sense of the idea here is that it's one of their poets. Think of it in our modern day that this could be one of their top pop stars in their songs or whatever and they're singing about this. What do they say? It says the, the creations of their own selves, they say the creations are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. La la la, we are evil beasts, you know, uh, always liars, slow bellies and they were proud of it. Proud of it. It's their national identity. Okay? You see that? It says, um, always lying so much that they don't see it as a problem okay now why was this important was that as souls were saved in Crete right and members were added to the churches there is a natural tendency in the flesh to carry all this cultural baggage and all that that way of life into the church. And that's why there is a need to set things in order, to lay down proper instruction, right? To exhort everyone or sometimes to even rebuke this. Why? Right? You know, Pinoy churches have a certain tendency. I don't know all of it, Pastor. I just still have not fully understood the cultural leaning. But I can tell you in, uh, in Singapore, people pride themselves on their on being very prudent so they value their worldly wisdom especially when it comes to finances which then mean that people are not always prepared to follow and obey the Lord by faith they want to apply their financial wisdom and understanding which often is a spiritualized version of their unbelief okay culturally for instance uh, the Asians okay the Chinese for instance uh, let's say my country will handle conflict differently from let's say the Pinoy's and so what happens it affects the way the church functions it affects the way we interact with each other. All right? Now, all this, so in the case of the Christians, was that what? They were always liars. Can you imagine that? You, the, how do you do counseling in the church like that when everybody is always lying and they don't see it as a problem? All right? I was like, okay, have you read your Bible today? Uh, yes, yeah, yeah, I will. <laughs> liar, liar, pants on fire. All right, this is evil beast. Why? Notice, they follow the wicked, animal-like appetites of their lust. So, if you understand, if you think about animals and, and what things they would do, you know, I could imagine that the churches there were full of fornication, adultery, and all these other things. Why? Because why, they followed their animal-like lust. That's why you say they're evil beasts. And then, slow bellies. Oh, they don't like to work. You get them and say, oh, time to get to work. You know, time to go to work. Take a, you know, you got to report to your job. Well, oh, my back hurts. Oh, oh, oh. oh basketball. Let's play basketball. Ah, oh, no problem. <laughs> I said, hey, hey, the boss just came. I said, hey, what are you doing playing? Ah, oh, ah, oh, my, my leg, my leg. I said, the slow bellies. It's very hard to get them to move. All right, like a carabao. Sometimes you need a long, sharp stick to poke the garba to get, the, get him to move. Okay? Now, what was the solution? These men are to... Verse 13, this witness is true. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith. That's so nasty. That's not nice, Pastor. Why do you do that? You offended our feelings. Is it rebuke them sharply so that what they may be sound in the faith? Okay, now, so I want us to see here that um, there are men 
who are put in place to deal with these issues, all right, beginning with the pastoral leadership. Okay? Let's turn to Acts chapter 1. We'll take one more example and then uh, we'll look at one more example and then we will take a break. Before someone dies, okay. Mm. Yeah. Because we don't have enough time between the conference and the church camp to conduct a funeral. Okay? So, now, look at Acts chapter 1. And I want to see this. Now, this here is an example. Okay, so we're still talking about problem solving. All right? And beginning with what? The men. Uh, who are appointed as elders in the church, as in the pastoral uh, leadership weapons, they are to address these problems, in, and which may include uh, false doctrine. That's why they use sound doctrine to exhort and then to convince the gainsayers. They also have to address and rebuke sharply those that culturally follow their natural, their, their, the lust of their own flesh and, and the wickedness. Right? And every nation, every group of people have their own version of this. Okay? Now, then we come to Acts chapter 1. Look at verse 15. Because here you see the church at work together. Right? Beginning with what? An elder. It says, And in those days Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said, The name, number of names together were about 120. All right? So before the day of Pentecost, you see there were already 120 names right? uh, that listed the 120 names of members in the church. This is before the day of Pentecost. Okay, because why? Jesus said he, he will he said, Well, I will build my church. Well, he, in his earthly ministry he already did that. They already had a treasurer. Okay. Now, here he stood up and said, Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas who was guide to them that took Jesus, right? He was the one that led all, uh, all the men to arrest Jesus. He identified, did, uh, had a positive identification, right? Betrayed him. Now, look at verse 17. For he was numbered with us. He's one of the 12 and had obtained part of this ministry. Now, they pointed out he is, he is a co-laborer. He is a partner in the ministry, you see that? All right. Remember, Judas was one of those that went out and preached, sent out two by two by Jesus, even performed miracles. All right. He preached the gospel of the kingdom to all that. Now, then it says, Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity, and falling headlong, he burst asunder in the midst, and all his bowels gushed up. Now, this was a description of Judas, what he had done after betraying the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. He took the money, he bought a field for himself, and then later in his regret, right, what, what did he do? He hanged himself. When he hanged himself, when they took him down, he said, falling headlong, he burst asunder. Right? Dead people, a bit of biology here, when someone dies, right, the gas, the, bo the bowels and all that, the intestines, they continue to digest the food and it produces a buildup of gas. When they, his body came down and hit the ground, boom, it exploded. Everything gushed out. Okay? If you ever had to be in the emergency services or the paramedic or whatever, and you had to retrieve someone who committed suicide, this is one of the very nasty things. You grab the body and it could just boom, and it's all over you. Okay? Now, he died. All right? And it says that it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem in so much that as the, that field is called in their proper tongue, Akeldama, that is to say the field of blood. Now look at verse 20 because now up to this point, Peter laid out the problem. Okay? But you need to have a very wise pastor because laying out the problem is very critical. If you identify the wrong problem, it doesn't matter how well you execute the solution. You fix the wrong problem excellently. Thank you very much. But you still have not dealt with the issue. You get what I'm saying here? We must fix the right problem. Okay, he identifies the problem. None, now, look at this. 
In the next few verses, he lays out now a proposal for the solution. Right? Now, this was for the purpose of the members of the church because they are all there to hear this, to approve this, and to solve, select, right, what path to take. Okay, now notice this. Verse 24 is written in the book of Psalms, let his habitation be desolate, right? Notice the place, his home, the place that he bought, whatever it is, let it be abandoned, desolate. This is, um, and let no man dwell therein. Nobody touched that field after Judas killed himself. Okay, this would be a prophetic fulfillment of what was in the Psalms. And let his bishop break, let another take. Okay? I looked up this word, bishop break. It's very interesting. The other place where this appears is in 1 Timothy chapter 3. It says, if any man desire the office of a bishop. You see here? Peter was pointing out to everyone that Judas disqualified himself as one of the pastors. Just let another man take over the office of his, as bishop. We see why that was the case. It says, wherefore, all right, of these men, that means which of these men which have company with us, okay? It says, okay, the whole point is, Peter is saying, which of the men who have accompanied with us all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us? That means these, which of the men who with, were with us and with Jesus during his earthly ministry, right? Beginning from the baptism of John unto that same day that he was taken up from us until his ascension into heaven, must one be ordained to be a witness with us of his resurrection. So we see it's very clear the uh, as the apostle, all that he has to be an eyewitness, right? It says of his earthly ministry and then of his uh, death, burial, his resurrection, and then his ascension to heaven, right? They were together with all the other disciples who had been, they had spent time with Jesus for three and a half, or was it three and a half years, yeah. right? So what happens? The decision, the ball was now in everyone's court, the members. Because the next verse, verse 23, and they appointed two, Joseph called Basabas, who was surnamed Justice and Matthias. So who do we have? Uh, Basabas Justice or Joseph Justice and Matthias, two men. Who did the choosing? The members. Okay? Based on the criteria that was laid out, the specification and criteria was laid out by Peter, who spoke on behalf of the elders of the church. All right, uh, now, do you see the partnership and cooperation here between the elders and then the members of the church? Okay, now, in dealing with the uh, Baptist distinctives, we go back to the, what, the priesthood of the believe, believer. And you see here that they were in a position to judge correctly to come to the right solution. Amen. Right? They were competent to be able to make that decision. And here, is it they now this is not just about men because here they, they shortlisted two persons, they appointed two. But they needed only one. Okay, so and they pray, look at the, sec, the next part, 24, and they pray. Why? Because now, in partnering with God in prayer, they want to know, Lord, what do you think? Why? Right? Because here, man is able to evaluate things. Right? We can check things out, evaluate, and say, okay, this is good, this is good, this is good. All right? I know some guys, they are like, oh, well, she's nice. She's also very nice. She's also very now, here, we can come down to, okay, there, there are two choices, but which is the best? And they pray. All right? The ministry of prayer is very important. And said, Lord, that thou, Lord, which knowest the hearts of all men, show whether these two thou hast chosen 
And I mentioned this before that it's no longer what they're praying here. It's no longer what I want. All right, as a church, no longer what we want. Lord, what do you want? Help us to recognize your will. Okay? So what happens? Now, the wise master builder, they recognize the problem. They actually help formulate the, the problem, what was the real problem to solve, what was the proposed solution, and then what happens? They implemented it, right? No. They brought this before the members. All of them working together and then in prayer, seeking the direction of the Lord to set things in order. All right? Because, look at their prayer. Lord, thou Lord, which know the hearts of all men, show whether of these two thou hast chosen that he may take part of this ministry and apostleship. Right? To serve in that particular ministry and also to take up the office of the apostle, which from which Judas by transgression fell, that he might go to his own place. Now, in praying, everybody, when they prayed this, they recognized one thing. You know, Judas fell from that office of the bishop because of his transgression, his sin. This is in Acts chapter 1. And already in the first chapter of the book of Acts, you see a disqualified pastor was replaced by members of the church. Let that sink in for a while because we've been indoctrinated, all right, and things are repeated over and over again such that we believe, we understand it differently. The key thing is this, go back to that word bishop prick because why? That word was, the only other time it was used was if any man desired the office of a bishop the pastor okay no no it didn't just refer it wasn't oh but they replaced this because okay they, they thought it was necessary to replace him he had already disqualified himself now they had to remove him after they removed him they replaced him Right? And they gave forth their lots, and the lot fell upon Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. Okay? Now, I want to point out one thing here about decision making also. Now, remember, when you come down to this, this is also an example of what? A multitude of counselors in action. This was selected based on what? A majority vote. Okay? Now, I want to point out something because this has happened over the last few years. People will say, well, I didn't vote for Duterte, he's not my president. Okay, I didn't vote for Donald Trump, he's not my president. No, the moment you vote, you participated in the process of selecting the right candidate. Even if yours was not the majority vote, you participated, you were involved with the decision you help choose make that choice therefore that is your precedent you see what I'm saying here why do I say this because this is important because members sometimes will well I didn't vote for that you know uh, I you know I didn't vote to upgrade the the, the, the mixer and the sound system you know I, I wasn't in agreement to that no you participated in that decision and when you did that, you voted. You already made a choice. Now, what happens is this. Sometimes, as the pastor, uh, maybe on a decision I get outvoted because I chose B, everyone else chose A. All right? 20% of us chose B. Now, can I say this? As pastor and also a member of the church, I respect the process and I respect the final decision because why? I was involved in that process. Okay? And the members have spoken. And if the members have spoken, this is the final decision. Okay? Now, granted, so now this then brings us to a very fundamental problem because we want the church to arrive at a spiritual decision. 
You can't have that if you do not have a saved membership. Amen. Okay? If you don't have a saved membership, you cannot arrive at a spiritual decision. decision. It will always be led by the flesh. Okay? And because of that, you're incapable, you're, you could be stuck. Okay? Sometimes, and so the other problem comes that if a church is very lax or loose uh, when it comes to uh, having a safe membership, you could have a sizable percentage who were never saved, who need to get saved. And what happens? Again, being un, there is a number that cannot arrive at a spiritual decision. The church could be deadlocked. That's where you get the fights. That's where you get the contention. Okay? That's where you get the disunity or so. Again, if the church members are not spiritual, they are carnal because they have been distracted by the things of this life, by the things of this world, they may all be saved, but you know what? We've been allowing sin to fester in our life. We, we're not walking right with the Lord. It's also difficult to arrive at a spiritual decision. Why? Because Paul rebuked the saved members in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He said, For ye are yet carnal. Why? The evidence of that, of that was well, there was division, there was contention. One says, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Paul, I'm of, you know, somebody else. And he says, all this envying and strife and all that, this is evidence of the carnality. So, big stepping back, wrapping the, all this up. The members of the church need to constantly strive for holiness and walking in the spirit. Otherwise, you can't function. You cannot make decisions. Okay? You can make all sorts of decisions, but it's hard to arrive at the right one. Okay? Remember 1 Peter chapter 3? And I'm, I'm kind of just connecting all the dots, right? We talked about different things. I'm trying to connect all the dots now. It says, husband and wife, what happens if, if you don't dwell with each other according to knowledge, right? And you're divided against each other and you're not treating each other right, whatever. You do not, husbands, you don't honor your wife as the weaker vessel. It says, you, you suffer from what? Not, not only not having the grace of life, you see, your prayers are hindered. This church there, they all got together, they prayed. It says, show us which of these two thou has chosen. And you know what? If your prayers are hindered, oh man, how are we in the, as a church going to ever arrive at a decision? Do you see how everything is interconnected? Okay, now I'm frightened. All right, I'm frightened at the implications. Right, because a lot of the responsibility falls on our shoulders. Right, as men and women in the church, we and uh, folks realize this: God uses us to fix things and to set things in order in the churches. Every one of us. Okay. And because of that, realize there is a heavy responsibility and burden actually on our shoulders. Can you imagine if we follow our flesh and just our likes and dislikes, our, our feelings, you could end up choosing to support the wrong missionary, ordaining the wrong men. Okay? And I think if you look at the the train wreck and the trail of destruction left by all sorts of men in the ministry whoever you know I dare say those there were a number of bad choices okay the spiritual quality the spirituality of a church is important although because without that it hinders its ability to make right judgment Right, and so beginning with the pastor to the members, this is important. I okay, I hope you, you get that. All right, let's take a break, and uh, we'll just close in a quick word of prayer, and then uh, we'll come back again. Father.